Okay, so welcome to OP244 for the second time. Uh, uh, today we are going to uh, start the lecture and actually talk about what's new in, in, in uh, OOP244 and uh, uh, what we are here to learn. Um, first thing first, I'm going to open up uh, Visual Studio for first few sessions. I'll do this. I'll open the Visual Studio. I'll create the, uh, the concept application over it. And, so you can see, but after that, then I'm going to make it ready before coming here and just opening it up. So first, uh, start the Visual Studio. Studio. Um, if you have created several things, it shows you the latest things you created, creating a new project. Uh, it tells you what is the last one, but when you are at school, because everything's from scratch, you have to always go over here and look for empty project, C++, Windows, and console. And click on Next. And select where you want to actually create it. In our case, it's going to be into the, in the repository. And this is going to be um, 05, September 6th for section C, right? C, all right. Okay. And create it, and three years later, we're gonna have our project created. All right. So, I'm gonna add a new file. Call it prg.cpp, as usual, include IO stream using namespace std, int main, return zero, compile. We are ready to go, okay? It ran perfectly, and this is the output, okay? A program that does nothing, all right? Um, next thing, uh, the workshop. So the workshop is uh, almost done. I'm gonna put the draft up. It's gonna say, say version 0 0.9. So you can start working on your in-lab. Uh, for the next session, and it's going to look like this. So I'm going to bring it up so you can see what the workshop is. Um, and I'm going to post it as soon as the... Uh, um, it, I, I almost put it up, but um, um, I was late for class and I came over here. So uh, compiling modules. This should be very easy for you. Why? Because you have already done this in, in IPC 144. This workshop is actually designed for the time that we used to write everything in IPC 144 in one file. You've all done IPC 144 in many files. Each one had its own C file and a header file, and then you included the header files. You did all those beautiful stuff, right? So this is kind of a C++ vert. It's not even C++. It's just the extension of C++. The program is C, and it's using C out. So you are not doing anything new. You should be able to do this very quickly. Um, uh, so for the first, so a workshop is going to be 30% for in-lab, 35% at home, 35% do it yourself. Um, uh, what you're going to have will essentially be this. So for the in-lab, you have the w one inlabcpp that you already have on your uh, lecture for last, uh, from last day. But that has minor differences. Don't work on that, OK? It has minor output differences. If you work on that one and use this one, it's not going to work out. So take this one. So you already have all the prototype of the, of the functions over here. You have the functions. You have to just separate it into files. And it tells you exactly which file is for what. So essentially, it tells you for lab one, um, these are all the stuff for it, lab submission penalties, like what happens if you 
hand this late and hand that late, all the policies and things, and they're all automated. So I'll just program it in Submitter, and it just applies these rules for marking for it. Um, so you get the original source code from what you just saw. It's going to be to WS01. Um, it tells you how to do it from the lab, but if you have prepared your computers at home the way I ask you to do so, using those YouTube videos, you can do it exactly at home, okay? Again, if you do not have uh, a PC running Windows 10, download the virtual machine, install it, install Windows 10 and Visual Studio, nothing else you need to install on it, okay? And use that visual, uh, virtual machine to do your work for uh, OP244 and then 345 and then for game programming, virtual machines are not powerful enough. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you, so you follow the, the steps. You download the code. These are all doing things, but step uh, one for in lab is to uh, individually uh, separate, uh, first compile this and see what is the, uh, the output. So essentially, just download the code that is this one. No, no, not that one. Download the code that is this one execute it, see how it runs. And it's uh, almost like previous semester. It's the same thing. It's just, uh, it's like Microsoft. Like Windows 10 is exactly what it was before. It just, they just change the background and they give you some, so it's something like that. So it's the same thing, but the output and things are a little bit different. So it's a program that you, uh, draws bar charts for you depending on number of samples. So if I have three samples over here, then if you, go out of uh, sequence, it's going to tell you to enter the samples, then enter the samples, they're so going to be 30, I don't know, 50, and say 433, then sh show the graph. So this is going to be the graph for those values, okay? It just puts a um, bar graph for it. It's a very simple thing. And exit gets out. Um, that's how it is. That's going to be the... Uh, so essentially, your program, you don't do any programming for workshop one. All you do is to copy the code and organize the code in proper files and recompile. That's all you're doing. No programming whatsoever, okay? That's for in-lab. So in-lab, you just do this. You put it in a files. Which files are you going to put it in? It mentions over here, exactly not here. Mentions over here that it's going to be on the... Um, website, uh, what goes where, so it asks you to create three modules, Cenograph, Graphs, Tools, which means when we say three modules, Cenograph is Cenograph.cpp and Cenograph.h. Graph is Graphs.cpp, Graph.h, and Tools is Tools.cpp, Tools.h. You create these things. Cenograph is the main, so it doesn't need any header files. Graph and Tools are the ones that are going to hold the uh, uh, header file and the CPP file. Then it tells you um, exactly which functions are supposed to go in them and one by one compile them separately, see if everything works. This is for future when you are actually writing code and you write only one module and you don't have the main yet, you want to see what you have written syntax-wise is correct or not, you can compile your code but don't create the executable. So this is how you do it. Okay, so you compile only one piece of code uh, one module uh, like this, and as you see, you put a dash C over there. That dash C means compile only. Do not create any executable out of it. And just compiles and creates the object file, but it won't create any executable because there is no main in that. It's just compiling the code. After doing all that, then you're going to go to the at-home section, which is essentially preparing your computer, which you have done already. Uh, for the, the only thing that is adding over here is to add safeguards to your code, uh, to your uh, header files. We'll talk about it today. You'll see exactly what they are. Uh, and that's that one. So it essentially adding these. Okay. Uh, one thing that I have to uh, uh, tell you that is the name of the school is changed again. It's the School of Software Design and Data Science. Uh, and uh, every code that we are going to write will be under the namespace SDDS. What does it mean? You'll see soon. That's what we are going to talk about today. For the at-home submission, I'm going to give you another program. So let me close the in-lab. So 
it is, you are doing the exact same thing, but no hand holding, which is essentially this one. This one is a phone directory. So what it does, essentially, it holds phone numbers and names, saves it in a file, and you can search it later on. Um, so you don't need to understand how the functions work. Appreciate that, OK, and understand that. So specifically, I wrote code in here just to you the what the hell. You don't need to. You are just moving code around. OK, so if something over here doesn't make sense, it doesn't matter. The functions are working. Everything's correct. OK, that's what you need to know. All right, so you can list all the phone numbers that we have in the file. This is the file that's going to come with it. You can search for, the, for something in it. Let's say which, which of these names they have, it has man in it. So you go man. It's, these are the two that have man in it. You can add a phone number to it. So essentially, you can say add a phone number. So name is Fardud Soleil. And number is 416-555-5556789. So it's get added, list it. Fardud Soleil is over there. You can sort it. And then you can list it again to see if it's sorted properly. That's how it's sorted. And when you exit, it detects that you change stuff. It says it is changed. You want to save the changes or not? It would say yes, and it saves everything. OK? Now, if you load it again, everything's sorted in a file. OK? So very simple little code that I have written. OK? Uh, I'll give you the code. I'll tell you what are the modules, and that's it. So if you look at the code, nothing is commented. So you have to comment what each function is doing. So this is too lowercase. So you know it's actually changing, over to changing everything to lowercase. OK? Name in contact. Things that you understand, comment it, and you put a comment for it. If you look at it, there is only one function prototype up here. Why? Because the functions are written in order. The functions that are using the other functions are written below the ones that are being used. Therefore, no function prototypes are written, which means you have to write the prototype yourself. Header files that you create, if you are putting the functions in the CPP file, you have to copy the name, put it in the header file with a semicolon at the end. Oh, really? I can do this here? I didn't know that. Cool. I think I can draw stuff over here, but how? I don't know. Because when I have one in my hand, it actually detects it. Anyways, we'll find out. Anyways, uh, so that's that. Are we okay with it? Yes. I'll tell you the name of the modules. I'm going to say there's a file module, there's a contact module, there's a phone directory module, and there's a tools module. You have to look at the functions and decide what goes where. So essentially, file, any function that deals with file management should go to file. Contact, anything that deals with contacts directly goes over there. Phone directory, the main and whatever that is supposed to be. Tools, functions that are just used as tools, and it has nothing to do with anything specific, like to lowercase. OK? Something like that. So you have to just do that. That's all. OK, and you put, and depending on your taste, you may put the functions in somewhere else. And I'm going to comment you on that. If I did see you went cuckoo, like you put some file management thing in tools, then you lose a mark. OK? But if you just, for example, put the get name in tools, and I asked, uh, and you, you say, OK, get name could be name of anything, then we can debate on that. OK? So I could tell you, so I could give you a comment. So essentially, I, I want to see how you're going to manage it. That's all. And it's completely open. You can do it any way you want, OK, as long as it works. But you cannot leave all the files empty and then give this one as phone directory and see if it compiles. That, that's, that is one way, right? You can create four mod five empty files and dump everything in phone directory, and it will compile and submit, OK? 
That's why in every single thing that I'm, and I'm writing over here, every single thing that I'm writing over here says, please note that a successful submission does not guarantee full credit for this workshop if the professor is not satisfied with your yada, 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 which means if you just, or you could simply print the output and just give it to me, okay? So again, I have to make sure that what you're doing actually works, and I'm going to look at your files, and it goes from there. So that was the, the thing. The due dates, don't ask when it's going to be due and everything like that. When it comes up, um, first of all, it says over there what is the late penalty and all those things, so do the math. It says over there from the day of lab, this much, this many days, and so on and so forth. And when the submission script comes up, you can always say submit, put the name of what you're submitting, and put dash due. It tells you exactly what the due date of this thing is. All the due dates are, are going to be listed for you. Okay? So do it that way, and that's the easiest way. Any questions about? Yeah. Yeah, you, name of your professor slash, slash submit. Yes, but I am changing it. I'm changing it to make it more automatic for other profs to be able to do it easily. So few things are going to change, but uh, it's essentially the same. It used to be like 244 underline W. Yeah, like you would do IPC underline W1 underline home, things like that, remember? It's got to be a bit, little bit different. It's got to be kind of directory driven. So it's possible to be, like, to be 244 slash WS1 slash something, and then you submit it, OK? Uh, any other question? Suggestion? All right. Again, do not use the submitter program as a compiler, OK? Do not use the submitter pro program as a compiler. Don't write your code and say, I'll submit, see if it works or not before compiling it on matrix and running it manually, okay? Run it manually, make sure everything's okay, then do the submission, okay? And one more thing that I did not mention to any class, very important thing. You're gonna send me email messages, and um, one of the things that is extremely big turnoff for me that I hate is people getting screen capture of their, uh, of their screens and send it to me. Worse than that, taking pictures with their cell phone out of the screen of their monitor and send it to me. You are programmers. Copy and paste the code. Read the thing. It says the errors are saved in error.txt. Send me an email, attach that file. What is it like? Yeah. If I had a brain tumor, you want to take a picture and send it to me, I would understand. But please, no screen capture image of anything. I do not like that, okay? That's a big turn off for me. Number two, be descriptive. My program doesn't work, it doesn't submit, what can I do? What can I, like, what is the answer to that? You have to be specific. You have to try to fix your code, Say, my program didn't compile. This was the error message. I found out that this happens, but I, no matter what I do, it doesn't work. How do I fix it? Then in two seconds, I'm going to go and find out where the problem and attach the files that you have problem with, zip it into one thing, and send it to me. So I can open it up, take a look at it. Or even better, if you created your GitHub account, put it in a repository, add me as a contributor to the repository, tell me it's in this repository, go fix it for me. Now I'll go open the GitHub. Clone everything, take a look at it, fix it, put it up. You can take a look at it and see what the differences are. Okay? Be, act like a pro. That's 90% of the thing. Believe it, believe me. You act like a pro, you'll become a pro little by little. Okay? Okay? Thank you. Just, it, it was something that I, drove me nuts last semester. That's why I little, sounded a little angry. But uh, that was the reason. It's like, 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 just imagine, they send a picture of their monitor that they took sideways. They didn't even do the effort to, to, to stand in front of it. So all the images go from big to small, half blurry, and it says, this is my error message. Come on. Okay, copy, paste. <laughs> Anyways. All right. Uh, 
You will do it. Don't laugh at me. You yourself will do it. Uh, those people who laugh, they, they, they are the ones who actually did it last semester. Anyway, so that was the thing. Any questions? Any questions about the, about the workshop? And then we're going to go into philosophy a little. Are we okay? All right. She did it, I know. <laughs> All right. So, that's, uh, yeah, um, I think that's it. There is nothing C++ in this other than stuff that we're going to learn today. Okay, very little things. Okay, there's nothing C++ in here. It's all C. Any questions? Suggestions? Objections? All right, let's begin. Who knows what is an object? Pardon me? Wow, that was a good fourth week answer. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. So what is a class then? If object is an instance of a class, then what is a class? Do you know? You are, you are supposed to not know, by the way. When I ask you a question, all these questions that I ask, you are supposed to guess. If you know, it means you studied before, thank you. But if you do, didn't, it is OK and 100% right for you not to know. If you don't know, simply say pass, and I'll go to the next person. What is a class matter? You can say pass, or you can answer it. These are the two. Pass. Properties and values. Okay, so I just wanted to see, like, who can, like, anybody knows what a class is? Okay, go, 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 go. Beautiful. So, uh, I should write that down for my next lecture. Oh, share commonalities. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so perfectly correct, actually, both of them. That's exactly what we have started in IPC 144A structure. Remember that? So, anything that we had shared stuff, things that were related to each other for a purpose, we put it in a structure together. You wanted to say something? Yeah. Oh, another thing that I had to mention. La, la, la. Use your opera voice in class. Did you understand what I said? No. Okay, you have to be like this. Loud, okay? Be loud, okay? Believe me, when I came to Canada, I was like this. And I didn't get a job. The day that I put my head up and started screaming, next day I had a job. Okay? That's what you have to do. Present yourself, okay? Present yourself. My lady. Connection of definitions. This is one of the right answers that is essentially the right answer for anything. <laughs> what is your name? Collections of definitions. <laughs> right? That's perfectly correct, actually. That's very wise, very smart. Okay, so collection of definitions. Yes, but we're going to come to that. Yes. So, as structure, we said, why do we have, why did we, why did we create a structure? Okay, um, so I want to carry my laptop, I want to carry that power supply, and the mouse, and few exam sheets, and it's falling off my hand, right? Because I'm carrying five things with me, correct? I put them all in a backpack. Now my life is beautiful. I pick up my backpack and I go, right? That's a C structure. You had six things that they were related to each other. Belo they, belong, 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 they belong to the same thing. And then you put it in a container so you can carry it. I'm talking about a student. Student has a name, student number, uh, the GPA, number of courses taken, and whatever. So five different things. You wanted to work with 50 students. You had to create five arrays of 50 things. Then you had to... Make sure that the index of all these things, like index three, relates to what the same student. You had to go through them one by one. Oh my God, that's difficult. So 
So what did we do? We said, okay, we're going to put everything in one structure. We call it a student. Instead of five arrays of 50, I just create one array of structure of students, and everything comes within a structure. It's exactly like you're going to McDonald's, where you should never do, and you say, I want combo number three. They give you the burger and the fries and the drink, and they ask you if you want to supersize it or not. So something like that, right? So, so, so you don't have, because you're too lazy to say, I want the hamburger. And I want, so you simply say combo number three, and combo number four, OK? It's the exact same thing. We don't want to carry five different things. We put it in a structure. That's the extent of C, plus, uh, C, C language. C++ takes a step back and adds a philosophy to programming, adds a methodology to programming, certain aspect and point of view. Car, what comes to your mind? Give me a, something that you, something that, wheels. wheels. What else? Sure. Lamborghini. Uh, no, 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 that's good. Uh, frame. frame, frame. Like a body. Oh, body frame, good. Bucket seats. Seat belts. Engine. Colors. Seats, windows, OK. Now we could recognize UI programmers, user interface programmers, and business logic programmers right off that. All those people who talked about steering wheels and uh, uh, brakes and windows and things like that, color, these are people who like user interfaces. People who said wheels, engines, frame, these are people who want to write the business logic. And lucky for you guys, business logic is much easier than user interface because you're not dealing with idiots. You're dealing with logic. Okay? User interface, by default, anyone who sits beside the computer is an idiot. That's how you have to write it, right? But if they say foolproof, they really mean it. It's not like a terminology because fool people sit beside the thing and it's still going like that to, to when you ask their age, they go bananas writing banana, OK, <laughs> instead of their age. So you have to detect all those things. So user interface people, sorry for you. You have to have your work cut off for you. So usually when you are, when you are writing a program, 30% of the program goes thinking about how the business is supposed to work. 70% goes, how am I supposed to deal with the stupid customers? OK, that's, that's what it is, sadly. That's reality. So. What is a car? How can, you, how can you talk about a car in C language? I said car, and you give me 25 different things. And by the way, none of you, and it's beautiful because you're coming from IPC, none of you said driving. I said car. Everybody said wheels, bucket seats. Lamborghini, was it? Lamborghini. You know what I mean? Like, no one said driving. And that's what we want to do in C++. The only difference between C and C++ is that in C++, we try to simulate an already existing object out there into our program. Therefore, our structure not only has variables in it, but it also has behavior in it, functions in it. So essentially, the car in IPC144, it has, I don't know, size of the engine and a color and whatever. And then you have a function called drive outside. An argument of your drive function accepts a car. In C++, it's completely the other way. You create a class or structure, potatoes, potatoes, same thing. A structure is a class. Question for your interview. It's something that I always ask. What is the difference between a class and a structure in C++? Nothing. They are both classes. You just because it's a class, right? So 
you not only create a class, uh, a car with all the features in it, but you add a behavior in it. Move, stop, accelerate, things like that. Okay? If you have a window, the class window, object window, becomes one of the properties of car. So car, that is an object, a class by itself, has a class inside called window. And that window has a function called roll down and has another function called roll up. So you can say, window, roll yourself up. And window will roll itself up. You know what it looks like? I'm going to be with you in two seconds. Sure. If, my, if, my, if I want to scratch my head, if I say my head is itchy, what's going to happen? Will he scratch his head or I? It's a stupid question, but it needs a very good answer. So I feel like, or, or if, my, if, I, if my head is itchy, will I scratch her head? No. Everybody knows where their head is. That because it's an object-oriented world. We are all people. When you say a person, you say head, hands, foot, walk, talk, right? And each of us have their own head. But if I tell you a human being, you close your eyes and you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly what the behavior is going to be. Of course, there are variations and differences and things like that. But the general point of view is brought to you by the design. That design that we make instances of, that human, that I have one class called human, I create 30 objects out of it and put it in my class, and it becomes a class of humans, a session of humans. So I have one class, human over here, and 30 objects. One integer, an array of 30 integer objects. So integer is the class. If I say integer i30, integer is the class. i30 is 30 instances, 30 objects of type integer. Your question. So you mentioned that uh, concept. Are you talking about drive? That was in C language. C language is a freaky thing. You know what C language looks like? OK, I'm going to tell you what it looks like. The question was that when I was talking about C language, I said when we create a car in C language, we create a structure called car. And now if I want the car to move, I have to write a function somewhere else called drive car. And as an argument, I have to pass a car to it. So any car that I want to be driven, I have to pass that car to that function. Now, what is can you use the same analogy for C++? In C++, I create a class called car. The class will have a member function, or what, what we call a method called drive. Then I create an array of 50 cars, and I say, shoo, they all drive themselves, because they know how to drive themselves. They're all Teslas. Got it? All right. That's what's going on. OK, now. So where is the object? The object is one of those arrays? One of one. Integer i. Int is class. i is object. By definition, an object is an instance of a class. Object is something you can deal with. Class is only an idea, a design to build objects with. Class is a blueprint of an object. OK? It's 2 o'clock in the morning. You wake up, and it's dark. And you hear, hello. What you are going to do? Scream. Scream. Why? Because you had a method, a function that did not have an owner. If you wake up and your father is standing over there and says, hello, you're going to say, what are you doing in my room? Right? Correct? If you have a person saying hello is fine. But if I have hello in the air coming from no one, that's freaky. That's C language. That's structure programming. We have actions everywhere. You know what it looks like? It's look, it looks like, say, if a person wants to talk, they have to go to that booth. The name of the booth is talk. I can't talk. I have to go into the booth. 
Then I talk, I come out. Now you go in there, you talk, you come out. That's C. In C++, we give the ability of talking to every human being. And that human being can talk. Within it, knows what to do. And each function inside a class have direct access to the properties, to the variables of the class. So all the variables inside the class are global to the functions of a class. Each class, each function, if you write a, if let's say, let's put it this way, you have a variable called speed inside your class for your car, and the speed is set to 20. And you have a function called move in your car. If you say move, function move can access the speed to see how fast it has to go. I don't need to give the speed to the function anymore because that speed is part of the class and can increase the speed if it needs to. Do we understand? Again, if, if, you, if you feel that your head is itchy, you feel it yourself and you can, itch, you can scratch it. It belongs to you. You have access to everything of yourself. Okay? Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Next thing. Human talk. Talk is an action of a human being. It's one of its behaviors. It's one of its functions. Do we all agree with that? If I, <laughs> if I ask you how a human being talks, can you tell me? No. First of all, you have to know what type of a human being you're dealing with. Is it a man or a woman? Women talk with high pitch. Gentlemen talk with low pitch, right? By standard. OK, I mean, like, all right? Not only that, I have to then see what is the nationality. What is the language, right? So when I say a human being, that human being, you can, let's put it this way. I'm going to make it even better. A teacher, although not everyone agrees, but the teacher is a human being, right? <laughs> right? You're okay with that, right? So if I say, if I say, a teacher is a human being that teaches. That makes sense, right? Which means I do not need to mention that a teacher has a name. Why? Because you know a human being has a name. I don't need to mention that a teacher has a gender. Why? Because a human being has a gender. I don't need to mention that a teacher can walk. A human being can walk. I do not need to mention that a teacher can talk because a human being talks, right? Because of all these real aspects of what we call the base class, you can build new classes out of already existing designs with very much less effort. If I ask you to make a motorcycle for me, to build a motorcycle for me, an absolute essence of a motorcycle. I'm not asking for a Harley Davidson. I'm asking you for a motorcycle. If I ask you to explain to a child what a motorcycle is, what would you say? You gotta say, it's a bicycle with an engine. Right? That is essentially what it is. I know it's much cooler, but hey, right? So when I say it's a bicycle with an engine, I don't need to mention that it has two wheels. I don't need to mention that it has a little, can we call it steering wheel? What do you call that thing for a bicycle? I'm, as in, I'm an English as fifth language, so I don't know. Handlebars? Okay. Huh? Handlebars. Handlebars. So I'm not going to say that's handlebars. I'm not going to say that it accelerates. It has tires back and front. It has a lighters. Things like that come with it, OK? This, ladies and gentlemen, is called inheritance. Inheritance is what we say when you have a design. You build a new design out of an already existing design. One of the most stupid examples that I'm going to give you all the time 
is the example between father and a child. They say, that's inheritance. That's not inheritance. Or son and mother. I don't inherit anything from my mother. My mother is an instance of a human being. My mother has a function called birth that returns a human being. That's me. So inheritance in real life is not inheritance in object orientation. In inheritance, you have your mother's eyes. No, I have mammal's eyes. <laughs> I have a human being eye that is a mammal. Okay, So it goes that way. It's not like that. My father and I are actually instances of, of the same class as a, yeah, that is a human male. OK? Remember that. OK? So getting the features, like lots of people give that examples. Like, what do you say inheritance? Inheritance means I get stuff like this from my father. That's not the case. OK? Inheritance is always getting uh, um, um, design of an already existing design. So you have a blueprint of something, and you say, oh, I want that, but I want these features to be added to it. So you create a new class out of it. OK? What? You, you get it all. There you have no choice. But you choose which one to use. Yes. Yes, that's amazing. Create, designing something new with the design you had before. Because it is very easy to get confused with an in inheritance. You cannot inherit anything from an object. OK, you cannot inherit anything from an object. It becomes the, my father and I. OK? The design of an object that is a class you can inherit. So if the question comes up, what is the difference between a class and an object? You would again say, a class is a blueprint with which you create an object. You create an instance of a class. We call that an object. OK? Object is an instance of a class. These are all the questions for the quizzes coming up. Are we OK? Are we OK, one? Are we OK, two? All right. Pardon me? In what? In C language or C++? In C language, they are not the same at all. They tell you what is the difference between a structure in C and a structure in C++. The answer will be C structure is only a record, where C++ structure is a class, which can hold method and behavior. A C structure cannot hold. So if I write a quiz with two different versions, one question will be, what is the difference between a structure in C and C++? The next question will be, what is the difference between a structure and a class in C++? OK? I haven't told you yet. I'll tell you what it is. I'm going to give you the exact same uh, uh, example I gave you to the other class. I kind of feel like a tape recorder, but hey. Um, say I want to go to Tim Hortons, and I want to get a medium coffee. And apparently, they told me it's $1.80. Am I right? OK. Yeah, you go to Starbucks, you trader. Anyway, so yeah, so so Tim Hortons, one and only. Uh, a medium coffee, let's say one dollar and eighty cents, right? I check, I only have one dollar fifty. And you are with me. He's my student. He wants to impress the teacher, maybe get some marks. So I'm gonna say, can I borrow thirty cents? I want to get a coffee, I don't have enough money with me. He probably would give me, right? He, he, would, he, he, he maybe would say, oh, don't worry about it. I'll buy you this time. You'll buy me next time. Just do, you know, life is good, right? Right? Are we okay with this? Probably he would give me if he has the money. Or if he doesn't have it, he would tell me, Hank, I don't have any money. Sorry. Right? What would happen if I have $1.50 and I want to get Tim Horton's coffee? I go beside him, and I just put my hand in his pocket, look for 30 cents. The outcome is the same. They both work, right? I'm going to get 30 cents. 
Yeah, I'm probably going to slap in the face. Or if you want to go buy a TV or steal one from someone's house. Outcome is the same. This is you guys coming to my office telling me, I have written this program. I said, this is not right. So, but it works. Okay, this is but it works. The outcome is the same, but one of them is overriding, invading something. One of them is not. Can somebody tell me what is that? Getting someone's TV from their home for yourself without permission. Permission, which essentially means privacy, right? If I invade someone else's privacy, that's a big no-no, correct? And that's exactly the difference between a structure and a class. A structure is public by default. When you create a structure in C++, you can access everything open and easy and nice and beautiful. So if I want to have a class, if I create a class like this, if I actually create a class called, let's say, uh, struct uh, student, and in here I'm going to put character name, and I'm going to put integer age, exactly like the other class. Did you see the notes in the other one? No? That's exactly the same, right? So if I do something like this, another thing about C++ is that you don't need to repeat, repeat the struct when you actually instantiate the student. In C, I have to say struct student s. But in C++, when you, when you create a class, it immediately becomes a type. So you can actually say student s. And I can say s dot age is 25. Perfect. That literally means I put my hand in student's business and changing the age. OK? But if I do this, say employee, character name, integer age, and I create an employee, and I say e.age, this is what I get. Member employee scope resolution age declared in line 9 is inaccessible. You cannot change it. You have to ask for permission. You have to ask an employee to set its age. OK? You can't just change its age by itself. So if I want to set the age of an employee first, I have to create something that others can see. How? I create something public. And that one, let's say I call it set. And in that set, I will say I want character pointer name. Of course, it's a constant. And I want to set the age. Ah, that's a little confusing because I have age up there, age down here, right? There is a rule that we have in our class in, in Seneca uh, for, this is avoidable. I can, I can resolve the conflict easily. Remember I told you that every single variable that you have inside the class is visible to the methods inside? Remember I told you that? So this name is visible to set. Now set has an argument I sell called name, right? This causes trouble. There is a way to fix this. I don't want to talk about it now, OK? Instead, remember, from now on, any time you create a variable inside a structure or a class, any time you create a variable inside a structure or a class, make sure you start it with the prefix m underline for member. Not that big. m underline name. M underline H. Now I can do over here, of course, I need string header file. If I can type it. Include. Now, string.h, correct? In C, all the old existing stuff from C, okay, 
they don't have an H. You put, take the H out. Instead, you put a C at the beginning. It's the same header file, but you call it C string. OK? So C string. And now I can actually say over here, SDR copy into M name. And as, as soon as I say M underline, see what happens? It actually lists all the things that I have in class. So it's very handy. I can actually see what the, what the uh, we call this attributes or member variables, OK? So now I can say M name and name. And in here, I can say M age is set to age. So essentially, I am setting an employee's name or age. So, or I could call, I could do this. Set name. Set paint. That's a new version of name. OK, version 2.0. Set name. Set age. So in here, I'm going to remove the age. In here, I'm going to remove the name. In here, I'm going to remove that. And here, I'm going to remove this. All right? And remember, always reuse your code, which means your set should not do string copy anymore. Your, that one should say set name to name and set age to age. OK? So now, in here, instead of doing this that I couldn't do, I can simply say, employee, set your age, not name, age, if I can type it, age to 25. And that's perfectly OK. That's me asking for 30 cents. So employee puts the age in, your, in its own thingy. Why? Why do I do this? Am I crazy? Just write a structure and set it for heaven's sake instead of writing 50 functions over there for me. Why do I do this? Why? Because for every single thing that employee does, it can actually supervise the way you are setting stuff. What does it mean? It means when I'm setting the age, I can actually check if the age that they are giving me is less than zero, or the age that they are sending me is less than, let's say, 100. Let's, let's say anybody older than 100 is not allowed to work in our company. OK? Then I'm going to say age is set to minus 1. Otherwise, set the age. So what happens is that if somebody goes bananas, sets the age is 355 or minus 52, I'll set it to minus 1. What is that thing called? When I set the property of the class to an impossible but known value, they call it the safe empty state. You set the property of the object to something, so later on we can detect and see if anybody screwed up or not. If I don't have this one, it is absolutely impossible over here for you to detect what went wrong when somebody set the student age to 250. It will go, and the program will run, and it's going to go bananas. But when you do like, like this over here, now you have control. You're telling to employee to set its age, and it follows its own logic. Therefore, you will never make a mistake. Each object is aware and capable of doing its own private things. So you don't have to worry about it. And I, I create 50 of these employees, and each employee knows its own age. These are setters. These three functions that I have written are setters. I am setting the values of an employee. If I want to know what an, what an employee's age is, then I have to create a query, or what we call a getter. For a getter, I'm going to say over here, integer get age, and I simply return the age. So this is essentially me, at, oh, not that age, this age. So this is what I'm writing over here. So essentially, I'm asking, how old are you? And you're going to tell me 25. I don't have to go and sneak behind your back and take your driver's license and take a look at it to see what is your age. I'll ask you. And then over here, I can say, if 
gender is female, always return 25 after 25. So if it's 35, still they are 25 years old. My mother is 85 years old, she's still 25 to me. Okay? Are we okay with this? All right. So that's what it is. So none of the ladies laughed at that joke, but the gentlemen do. And, and it's reality. Like, yeah, she knows. She's 25. All right. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? So essentially, you take control of what happens within the guts of your object, and your objects are aware of how things are happening. Now, let's put name for all the things we talked about. Oh, I didn't talk about one thing. Let me talk about it. A car moves, right? A car moves. A bicycle moves, right? Do they move the same way? A pigeon flies. An airplane pl flies. Do they fly the same way? But they both fly. So when I say fly, you know what do I mean, correct? But when I actually say pigeon fly, no jet engine is going to go, <laughs> it's a pigeon, right? Correct? This, that. So what is the relationship between a pigeon and, a, and an airplane? They are both flying objects. They are both children of flying objects. They are both inheriting features of dry, flying objects, but they are changing the meaning of flight. A flying object, you don't know how it's going to fly. Exactly like talking. I said a human being can talk, but you cannot say how. If I told you create a sculpture of a human being, can you? Let's say you're Michelangelo. You are fantastic in creating sculptures. If I told you to create a sculpture of a human being, can you? No. How do you know if it's a male or female? It's not specific. It's a general class. It's a class that can only be an idea. You cannot instantiate a human being. You have to first clarify, bring it down to an object that can be instantiated, a male or a female. Now you can do something. You can instantiate a male or you can instantiate a female. You can do that. But still, talking is not set. You have to say, OK, this is a Turkish male, and that's a Chinese female. And then still, you can't say because you don't know what the language is, but you can kind of. So as you have to bring, clarify all the specifics, but the point is that the same function in different classes can act in a different way. An airplane flies, a pigeon flies. OK? This is called polymorphism. Poly, many, morph, shapes. So a class can extend itself in many different shapes. You can do the same thing in a different way. What is polymorphism? doing the same thing in a different way. That's what polymorphism is, OK? That's one rule of one. Object orientation has three legs. One of the legs is this. The other one, we talked about it, inheritance. To be able to get a design and bring it into a new design. You call this inheritance. Inheritance is re an object-oriented way of reusing code, OK? And number three, and the most important thing of object orientation is the capability of packaging the data, the variables, the attributes together with functions, behaviors, and methods. So to put the action and behavior together, to put the action and attributes to be together, data and behavior together, packaging it in one thing. The fact that you can have a function inside the structure in C++, that is called encapsulation. Encapsulation has a beautiful side effect, which is privacy. You can actually set something to be private or not. So remember, what is the difference between a structure in C++ and a class? A structure is public by default. 
by default. It's not that it cannot be private. I can put a private right at the, I can do this now. I can do this. I can say over here, struct, and in here say private. Absolutely no difference. Identical. Okay? The only difference is that class is private by default, structure is public by default. That is all and no difference whatsoever. And an object-oriented program is a program. An object-oriented program is an object-oriented design, is a design, is a program that uses all these three things in harmony, not just implying it for no reason. They have to actually work together. They call it synergy. They should have synergy with each other, and then you're going to be fine. Okay? Then you're going to have a, an object-oriented program. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Pardon me? Mm -hmm. One of the features. There are three features that makes a design object-oriented. Inheritance, encapsulation, polymorphism. Inheritance, reusing a design, having a design, making it into a new. Polymorphism, doing the same thing in different way. Encapsulation, putting the data and behavior together. Okay? Believe it or not, today I taught everything you need to know till the end of the semester. Okay? But we're going to name it one by one and show you how to implement it. Okay? You don't know. Like, I talked about virtual functions. You don't know what it is. I talked about virtuality. You don't know what it is. I talked about all the things that you need to know till the end of the semester. We covered it. Okay? So if you understood what I'm saying, you're in good shape. All we need to do to label it and tell you how to code it, and then you'll be fine. Okay? And that starts with creating modules. Any questions down to here? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then E was an OE. Yes, sir. Be the object. Mm -hmm. so, yes, that's the object. So, so no, I can't because I don't have inheritance. This is not an object oriented program. If I had over here, if I had a human up here, that's the syntax. Inheritance starts halfway through the semester. You don't, you're not going to know the syntax by then. But first, we have to go through things. But yeah, you'll see. But no, 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 no. This is not an object-oriented program at all. Zero, zilch, nada. It's a fancy structure-ish type of thing. <laughs> I don't even know what to call it. It just tells you. It, this only shows encapsulation. That's it. OK? Now. We have to till 4.10, correct? Till 4.5 or 4.10? 4.10. 4.10. Okay, good. Because uh, I, I want to show you what, how actually modules work, how to set up modules, modular programming. We're going to go through it. Uh, let me just bring up the, let me just bring up the, um, ah, this actually, yeah. Uh, so uh, welcome to object oriented, yada, yada, yada. Namespaces, programming language. Oh, namespaces. Did I say namespaces? As we're saying, programming languages. Type safety. Uh, too early to talk about it. Just letting you know that C language is very loose. You can set one type to another. You can put a, you can put a pointer in an integer. You can put an integer in a pointer. You can do stuff like this and doesn't complain much like, other than a little warning to you. C++ is completely different in that manner. They made the types much more secure, which means many of the things that you could do before you can't do anymore. Why do, you do, the, why do they do that? Because type conversions are one of the most, uh, one of the most common way of losing data and creating bug in programs. You have a, not a good example for type safety, but you have a long value, you put it in an integer with no regards. Long value.
hold much bigger of an integer, right? If you put it in an integer, you lose something without knowing and your program, your, your value is not right anymore. Okay, type safety is something that we have in C++ to make sure that uh, uh, you don't shoot yourself in the foot, okay? They are making it tighter and tighter. So the old casting that we had in C language, cast something to something else, they actually created three different types of templates to, to do safely casting. We'll come to it soon. Namespaces. <clears throat> now, imagine all the people, give me two seconds. Actually, uh, yes, F uh, give me five minutes. You, get, you take a break, five minutes for me to prepare something and then we'll continue the rest of the lecture. So five minutes, you go, I prepare something. Say we are working for a car company. Um, series of programmers, we are working for a com car company and the car company for we are working for has different departments, it has sales and say it has design. So design is a place, design is a place that they actually design new cars Sales is the place they're selling the cars, right? Now, if I want to create, and, and, I, and the, car, the company is a big thing, each part has its own development team. So the people working in a sales department are creating a class called car and put all the information they need to put in the car with respect to sales. I have a question. How many of you care to, to know if I can dance or not? You don't, right? But if, but if you, if I was right now on the stage of some place where people were dancing, or somebody who's a dancer, how would you care if the dancer knew C++ or not? You didn't, right? That's called abstraction, okay? It doesn't matter if I'm bald or not. I can still teach C++. So if you want to create a class for a teacher, you only put the specifications a teacher needs. If I was working as an actor, then you need that to know if I'm bald, if my color of hair is like this, if my eyes are this color, because depending on the features that you have, they hire you for certain jobs, so they need to know how, what you look like, correct? So if I'm a teacher, do they care what is my gender? Of course not. It doesn't make any difference if I'm a man or a woman, I can teach. It does not absolutely make any difference. This is called abstraction. So because of this fact that you can look at the same thing in five different ways depending on the business logic, depending on what the scenario of the system is, this is going to happen. If I work for a car company and the car company wants to uh, uh, have uh, a department to write a car, for the sales department and a car for design, then we're going to have two classes with the same name with completely different implementation. One is a car from a salesman's point of view. The other one is a car with, f from the point of view of a person who wants to create a new car. So it's going to be different, right? If that's the case, then if I put the whole system together and try to compile it, then my compiler is going to give me an error. How does the compiler work? How does the compiler work? Oh, let's first finish this thing. We'll talk, we'll talk about compiler afterwards. I have 20 minutes. So to fix this problem, C++ adapted something from object orientation. We call it namespace. So let's say I have different modules, and for each module I'm doing something, I'm creating uh, each. So in this file, I'm just assume the parts that I'm writing are in separate files in different places, okay? I tell to my team of programmers in sales department to write any code they want to write in the namespace sales. So when they are programming, they write namespace, sale, sales, and then they create a class car over here. And 
whatever the sales person needs. Right? And then in another company, some, in another department, that say it's design department of the company, I tell all the designers to write and do their design, to, to do their uh, uh, classes or whatever they create in design namespace. So I'm going to say namespace, DSN, DS design. OK? And then, uh, or let's, let me use the exact same uh, example of the other class. Manufacturing, I call this. OK? So one manufacturing, the other one sales. So people in manufacturing create their work in a namespace called MAN, M-A-N. So in here, they're going to say class car 2. Whatever the manufacturing department needs. OK? Goes over there. Because these two cars in, are in two different namespaces, if I compile this code, no conflict is going to happen. The only thing is that if I want to deal with the manufacturing version of the car, I have to qualify the car like that. I have to say man. Scope resolution car C M C I'm gonna call it. Okay? If I want to create a car of type uh, sales, then I have to say sales scope resolution car. Now I have two different ones. Now let's say in the program that I'm writing over here. I want to deal with the manufacturing part of the thing a lot. So 90% of what I'm doing is about car being manufactured and what is the cost for it. And when everything is finished, I'm going to create a car of, for the instance of sale and just set, set its price. So I have to do 95% of my work on manufacturing and only 5% is going to be on sales. If that's the case, writing man scope resolution, man scope resolution, man, it's too much work. I don't want to do that anymore. Because of that, you can always say using namespace man. Therefore, anytime you refer to a car with no namespace, it's the one in man. Because you are using manufacturing namespace. Are we okay with this? Mm -hmm. No, no, you can't. Oh, you're talking about just scope resolution at the beginning? This is the only way. The other, I don't. Oh, that's, that, that's sub namespace. That's not a class. If you have a namespace inside a namespace and you want to use that namespace, then you can do that using namespace something, and then go inside the namespace. That car was a namespace. It wasn't a class. OK? That car was a namespace. It wasn't a class. Now, so you can have, like, I can have in manufacturing, I can have cost management and design namespaces. I'm going to take a look at it. Maybe I don't know. I'm going to go take a look at it. But it doesn't make sense to me to use a class? So you're saying using namespace man car? OK. You're talking about these? 
that's that's this. It's the exact same thing. It means you're exposing only car to this thing and nothing else. And you see, using French yada yada yada. So when you do something like that, it means only car will be visible over here. It's not the namespace, it's the class. I don't want to go there for now. Okay? Give it some time. Again, something that I forgot to mention over here. When you look at what we have over here, thank you very much for bringing it up. When you look at the notes over here, there are things that I mentioned that are not in the notes, and there are things in the note that I'm not mentioning. Okay? Bring it up, but when I say please wait for later, please wait for later for that. Okay? So these are one of the things that if I, I can tell you it exists, but I cannot show you any use for it until we reach the end of the semester. <laughs> so I'm going to mention what it is. You're not going to know what it is, and when the time comes, eh. Okay? So anything that I do not mention to you and I tell you don't look at it is this one. Namespace, by far, the whole thing is something that we need to talk about later. But well, because we are using it, I am kind of mentioning it over here to, to, so we can use its limited dues. Let's do it for now. That part we'll talk about later, and thank you very much for that. Okay? So, anyways, what I wanted to say was, uh, uh, when you are using a namespace, <laughs> in no circumstance, you are allowed to use a namespace in a header file. Remember that. That's a big no-no. Okay? Why? Because when you using name, you, when you write using namespace in a header file, somebody can include that header file and without knowing it, starts using a namespace. And the car that it's putting over there without him knowing, he thinks it's going to sail, but it won't. You follow what I'm saying? So using namespaces should never be in a header file. If in a header file you want to refer to an object, always use the uh, qualification. Specifically mention which object of which namespace you want, if you need it in a namespace, in a, in a header file. Next thing. We do all our work in a namespace called STDS. We talked about it. Now let me give you the example for that. So again, going back into this car thingy, so that's 0, 2, namespaces. Oh, did I put 0, 1? I have to rename it. Can I rename it here? No, it's 0, 2. I'll rename it later on. OK, next thing. Creating modules in C++. When you are creating modules in C++, remember this. Let me just bring these over here so I don't have to type it for you. All right, so what I am talking about is this. How compilers work. By definition, we are going to have one module for each class that we create in our applications. So when you create one class, you have one module. What is a module? A CPP file and a header file. OK? Anybody over here have problem with colors? You all see colors? All right. So uh, <clears throat> when, when I create, a, let's say, a class car, 
when I create a class car, oh, too many closing. I create a header file for it, and I name it car.h. Okay? I put the specifics of my I car over there, okay? And I put it in the namespace stds. And as you see, the prototype of the methods, functions of the class goes inside with no implementation. One of the bad habits that we have at Seneca, that our profs even use it, is this. They don't put name in their prototypes. It compiles what works, right? But how the heck from this you can say what is the first and second and the third argument in here? Impossible, right? The values you write in here, you can write anything because compiler ignores it. Okay? Take advantage of that. Advantage of that. Say I have a car that has a make and a model and a license plate. I want to set those values with a set function. Create the three things that you are putting and write something over there that seven years from now, when your program finds a bug and you have to go fix it, when you look at the code that you have written seven years ago, you'll say, thank you, Farnad, for doing that. Because if after seven years you look at your own code, you will absolutely not remember what you have done. But with this one, you simply say, oh, okay, so the three things that I'm passing, I'm setting the make and the model. And the first one is the make, the second one is the model, and the third one is license. You don't have to go walk through and find out which one is what. Number one. Number two. The... Body of the methods go to the CPP file that always include that always include the always include the header file of the of the class. So essentially you say this is the set function, it belongs to car and it is in the namespace SDDS. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully on this. If we had two classes with the same name, I had collision, I had conflict, correct? If you have two namespaces with the same name, they merge. There is no conflict. They become one. So if you have five different files with same namespaces, simply the codes of all these things were merged together. Okay? That's why from now on till end of OOP244, you have to have all your code written in SDDS namespace. But in your mains, you use your namespace. Okay? So you code, implement your code inside the namespace. The main uses your namespace. Are we okay with this? Number two, how compiler works. Compiler works like this. When you have, for example, over here I have four modules. I have the blue module, I have the red module, I have the green module, and I have the main module that is brown. Okay? Now, when I call the compiler, when I actually write G++, blue.cpp, red.cpp, green.cpp, brown.cpp, and then I hit enter, compiler runs for four times. First, it compiles the first module in aware, unaware of any other module, completely separately compiles this and puts it over here. Then it goes, compiles the second one. Same thing. But module green is using this stuff in module red. That's why it's including its header file. So when it compiles over here, it sees that some functions are called over here. What goes up, it sees the prototype is there. It accepts the promise. It's like me telling you, down in the library, there are tutors that are helping you with C++. Everybody's happy, right? And if you have a problem, you go over there and try to see, and hopefully the tutor is there. Hopefully I kept my promise, right? Then you come to the next one. Now, the brown module is using the green module and the red module 
unaware that green module is already including red. So I will have the red module included twice, correct? And that causes an error. Because of that, we have to have compilation safeguards. What is a compilation safeguard in this case? Here it is. And this is the rule that you're going to follow again till end of OP244. You create a safeguard using those compiler commands. Anything starting with hashtag is you talking to the compiler, telling the compiler how to do your compilation. So all those things happen before your compilation. So what you do, you're saying, if then you create a unique name over there. How do you make this unique name? First, the name of namespace. That is SDDS all time. Underline. Then you take the name of the header file, all capital with an underline. So car.h becomes car underline h. And at the end, you add two underlines. That unique phrase, you tell to the compiler, if that phrase is not defined, continue compilation. Not execution. Continue translating the code into assembly, into machine code. So compiler comes and says, if this thing is not defined, what is the first statement after that to define it, right? So if it is not defined, the first thing it does, it defines it. Then it continues compilation, and it finishes. Now, with a second time this is included, the compiler comes, is this thing not defined? No, it is defined. Because it's defined, it stops compilation. It won't compile it anymore. Therefore, by adding those safeguards, you can have a code included 50 times with no problem, only once it's going to get compiled. So all your header files in this thing must have that in it, including the one you're going to write in do it yourself. Yes? Pardon me? You're talking about underline H, underline, underline? Mm -hmm. It's just the pattern that we create. Because it's car.h, you put car.h. You can go to a company, and in that company, they can say, I don't know, IBM underline car and two underlines. Don't write h. It's their rule. So essentially, again, I mentioned it in the other class, that you are not allowed to have your own style yet. And most likely, you never, have, you will, you never will have. It's your company that dictates you how to do things. That's the naming convention that we are using in our class for our safeguards that you have to follow. Reason behind it, it's just to make sure that everybody creates the names properly, the same way like everybody else doing, OK? All right. And that's it. Any other question? Any other question? No? Questions? Yes. Uh, so when are you uh, by tonight, it's going to go up. OK? Uh, it's going to go up. Again, it's a draft. So it doesn't tell you how to, comp how to submit yet. OK? And you're not supposed to. You're, su you're supposed to submit it in a lab, right? So I'll put it up, and uh, you'll see it. OK? Um, uh, any questions? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, using namespace? No, no. Using namespace is like a label. Like, like, like public column that you, everything after was become public. So when you say using namespace something, everything after that is. Oh, 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 OK. Let me, uh, uh, it's, there's a good question coming up. Let me just tell you. Um, you cannot unuse a namespace. When you use it, you use it. If halfway through you decide to use that, where is the other one? Let me just bring it up. In half, if halfway through you decide to use the sales namespace, OK? If you do that, after that, you have to qualify both of them. If I have using namespace here, and I have using namespace sales, 
okay? All the stuff that are not common, they don't need qualification. So if I have, say for example, robot in manufacturing as a class, and I have salesperson as a class in my sales department, those don't need qualification because there is no conflict. But any conflict in classes in those must carry. So this becomes a conflict. Now I have to put man over here. There is no other way around. What did I do? Oh, man here. Okay? Yes, if, if, you are, if you're using two namespaces and those namespaces, they have common names, then you have to qualify. But if they don't, then you're, you're, you're free. You're, you're okay to go. Anyways. Sales. So that's what I'm saying. If you, let's say, in, if you have over here a class, salesperson, OK? And then in here, you have a class, robot or boat worker, OK? So if I have something like this, if I want to instantiate the class robot, I can. Robot. There is absolutely no problem, or you can create it. There is no conflict. But if you are using a class that is shared between the two, then there is no way other than qualifying it. That's what you have to do. OK? All right? Questions? Suggestions? Objections? Thank you, and have a beautiful day.